And because we are part of a communion of saints, I want to draw attention to an important saint, Saint Josephine Bakita. She was born near, and I'm going to get this wrong, Jabel Ajalir in the Sud Darfur in Su Sudan. Kidnapped when still very young, she experienced the cruelty of slavery as she was sold several times in slave markets of Africa. Finally, she was rescued by an Italian family and brought to Italy, where she not only got her freedom, but she became a Christian and felt the call to consecrate her life to God as a nun. She joined the Canosian Daughters of Charity and lived the rest of her life at Shio, a small village near Vin Vicenza. She died on February 8, 1947. And so we pray. And for those of us who are Catholic, please join me in the sign of our faith. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O oh God, you always hear the cry of your people and have compassion for the oppressed and the enslaved. May they experience the liberation of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. We pray to you for those suffering the torment of human trafficking. Transform us by the power of your spirit to be sensitive to the pain of these, our sisters and brothers. Committed to overcoming this evil, give us the courage to stand up and work for the rights of our sisters and brothers who live in slavery and exploitation. We ask this with the intercession of St. Josephine in Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of the Assumption, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to introduce Roma and Ravine from Savas. They will explain what they do, what Savas is, and they will get us started on this topic. We often think that it's a uh, tra human trafficking is something that happens somewhere else. We're going to learn that it's happening right here in our own backyard. So thank you, Roma and Ravine, and I turn it over to them, and thank you for your mature attention to this topic. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ravlene, and this is... My name is Roma, um, and we're from the Savas of Halton. Uh, we're going to be talking about sex trafficking today um, within the uh, Halton region. Um, just a bit of a content warning, um, like the, like was previously mentioned, if um, if some content is triggering, um, please feel free to reach out to one of your teachers um, and and ask for support. We are going to be here after as well if you if you needed to speak with us, um, and just be mindful that this this content is um, you know it, it may be triggering to some people. Um, so so definitely um, seek the support of the people uh, around you if you do need it. So um, Savas of Halton stands for the Sexual Assault and Violence Intervention Services of Halton. We provide support to anyone who is living with, leaving, or recovering from um, violence, uh, sexual violence, and human trafficking. So all of our services in the Halton community are free, confidential, and accessible to uh, persons of all genders. We have a 24-hour crisis support line. Um, we have volunteers that provide support on this crisis line. We have individual and group counseling sessions, uh, which we provide virtually, in person, and over the telephone. Um, we provide up to 18 sessions for people who have experienced sexual violence um, and human trafficking. We also provide uh, support to people who are supporting an, a person who has experienced sexual violence or human trafficking. So a family member or a friend um, or e uh, another relative, we'd be able to provide them with counseling sessions as well. Um, we have the anti-human trafficking program, uh, which we will be talking about in a bit more detail. We provide crisis and um, transitional housing through, through that program, as well as practical assistance, along with hospital, police, and court accompaniments, um, advocacy, and navigating certain systems. Um, we also um, coordinate the Halt and Collaborative Against Human Trafficking um, that has about o uh, over about 20 um, different organizations that work collaboratively in Halt and to combat human trafficking. Um, we also have a public education program um, that provides presentations, workshops, and programming on sexual violence and human trafficking in the community. Um, and we also, throughout the year, host certain uh, social activism events such as Take Back the Night and Anti-Human Trafficking Awareness Day. 
So what is human trafficking? So according to the Palermo Protocol, Article 3, human trafficking is the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of persons by means of the threat or use of force or other forms of coercion, abduction, fraud, or deception of the abuse of power or of position of vulnerability or the giving and receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of a person having control over another person for the purpose of exploitation. In other words, it's often described as a modern day form of slavery as it's a crime that involves compelling or coercing a person to provide labor or services or to engage in commercial sex acts. So at Savis, we do differentiate between sex work and sex trafficking. Um, sex work is autonomous and independent as it is someone's choice to do that work. Um, sex, wo sex workers often control who they see and when they see them, um, and no one is profiting off of that work. Um, their work is not tied to their circumstances. This means that they are not working in the sex trade just to survive. Uh, but for the purpose of this presentation, we will be talking about sex trafficking, um, and we just wanted to make that distinguished um, that distinction uh, we di that distinction at this moment. So, on the other hand, sex trafficking is one of the fastest growing crimes in Canada, and it's when an individual is forced, coerced, and manipulated into working in the sex trade. So it's the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, obtaining, patronizing, or solicitation of a person for the purpose of commercial sex, where a sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion. So sex trade work can look like exchange of sex or sexual services for money, drugs, or food, taking and selling of explicit photos and videos, dancing and stripping or massage parlors, pornography or camming, in which camming is when someone is requested to perform certain activities, um, often sexual, in front of a camera for paying clients, um, or selling them as sex slaves, or even forcing them into prostitution. So being a sex worker and um, doing sex trafficking are two different things. Um, so when we talk about sex trafficking, we often talk about the game. So what is the game? Um, the game or the life refers to the world of trafficking and the sex trade. Um, traffickers will establish and manipulate relationships to lure someone into the sex trade. Um, sex trafficking, uh, tra sex trafficked persons really self-identify as being trafficked. They may consider their trafficker to be a friend, a partner, a family member, um, a boyfriend, girlfriend. Um, they may not recognize that what is happening to them is in fact a crime. Um, we will be explaining the four different stages of manipulation in the game. Um, and just to remember this isn't linear, um, that we can cycle through these stages, um, uh, survivors may cycle through these sta stages at, at different, um, different points um, and can return back to the stage as well. So there are four stages of manipulation. The first stage is luring, the second stage is grooming or honeymoon, third stage is coercion and manipulation, and the fourth is exploitation. So the first stage, luring. Um, you know, this generally happens through mutual friends, uh, family, or, um, or someone that is known to, to the, the person that is being trafficked. The, the trafficker may build a connection through social media, uh, maybe at a party. Um, traffickers try to make an emotional connection with the, the individual, oftentimes through a romantic relationship. Um, during this stage, they will test the boundaries and vulnerabilities of the person that they, that they are luring. Um, they learn how easy um, it may be to control someone and manipulate them um, by identifying those boundaries and uh, those testing those boundaries and uh, identifying the vulnerabilities. Um, they gain information by asking questions and probing into uh, a person's life uh, to find ways to lure them into the sex trade. Um, they learn about their family, friends, the dynamics at home, um, perhaps if they are you know, using certain substances, um, or you know, have some mental health uh, supports that may they may need. They may feel isolated, so they will learn about them a bit more to be able to lure them um, and and meet those insecurities. Um, traffickers use this as a s s you know sell you a better life. So they will say, I can provide you um, a better life. I can I can be your support person, um, and and they try to meet those needs um, and and identify the vulnerabilities, and then eventually uh, lure someone into trafficking. 
So the second stage is grooming or honeymoon stage, which consists of love bombing, which is depicted as excessive attention, admiration, and affection with the goal to make the recipient feel dependent and obligated to that person. So, for example, a trafficker will provide their victim with a lot of money or expensive gifts, trips, clothing, dinner, um, traveling, cars, and this in turn overwhelms the target and makes them feel as if they found a true connection since they're being showered with attention and gifts. So many traffickers tend to use this tactic to spend increasingly more time with their victim and in turn the victim spends less time with their family and friends this could also lead to substance use as it's typically disguised as having fun. And so through love bombing, there's this intentional development of a dependency relationship, which is seen as a manipulative tactic as it's deployed in order to gain the upper hand over the victim and increase their dependence on the trafficker. So the next stage is coercion and manipulation. Um, the trafficker may exhibit hot and cold behavior, becoming more hostile towards um, towards the person, to the survivor, the victim. Um, withdrawing affection and attention, um, reducing any communication and or compliments towards them. They might engage in emotional highs and lows. Um, you know, disobedience does get punished and compliance is rewarded. Um, they engage in ab abusive behavior that might be by um, physical, physical violence or even psychological, emotional threatening, um, you know, certain, certain family members or friends um, will use information they've learned as part of their manipulation to, to further, um, you know, force, force the individual to, to be, um, to engage in, in sex work. Um, they put pressure on, on the sexual boundaries and create an association between sex and money. Um, we will explain this in a bit more detail how that does happen in the next uh, stage. So the fourth stage is exploitation, which is where boundaries and self-esteem are completely broken down. So many survivors have actually described their, um, have described to have poor self-image or low self-esteem as a result of the trauma, which in turn creates a vulnerability that traffickers exploit. So this lack of self-esteem can also lead victims to crave attention and positive praise from traffickers for how much money they make. Um, there can also be pressure to pay back debts, so it's important to note that paying back doesn't necessarily need to be financial, but it could also be sexual activities. In the case that it is financial, it's usually coerced debt, which is a form of economic abuse affecting all non-consensual credit-related transactions that occur between the perpetrator and their victim. This brings us to threats to safety and threats to loved ones' safety, which can consist of the perpetrator harming the victim or their families if there is lack of cooperation. So when threatening in terms of safety, the trafficker establishes control over the victim and they're obligated to stay. So this could mean that there could be some sort of bodily harm to the individual, damage, destroy, or burn property if there is any, harming others that they may be related to. There could also be isolation and confinement from friends, family, or school. And traffickers have likely created a substance dependency and they maintain control over access to those substances, such as alcohol and drugs. Traffickers hold complete power and control over the individual psychologically and emotionally, which can also turn towards sexual abuse or physical abuse or verbal and so on. We often get asked the question, who is a trafficker or a pimp? Um, this can be actually anyone, um, from a stranger, acquaintance, friend, partner, um, a co-worker, or a family member. Um, a trafficker may also be male or female. Um, though most have been male, we are seeing that there are more female-identified traffickers um, that are being uh, identified. Um, they can be of any age, but often between um, the ages of 18 and 34 years old. Um, they can be part of a gang or organized crime. Um, they, they could be physically attractive um, and present themselves as trustworthy and honest. So who is most vulnerable and or at risk? So the ones that are more at risk are women, girls, or female identifying individuals, as well as youth, as they tend to be the most vulnerable. People who experience systemic oppression and marginalization, so 2S LGBTQ plus community, racialized folks, indigenous peoples, which has led to missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, immigrants and refugees, 
um, people living with disabilities or those that are neurodivergent, also those with low self-esteem or body image issues, those living in group homes, in unsafe home life, or they have some sort of home instability, history of abuse, current or past substance misuse, poverty, homelessness, and housing instability, or lack of a support system which makes them more vulnerable and susceptible to trafficking. Um, so why does trafficking happen in Halton? Um, there are several reasons why this occurs in, in this region. Um, the first one is the socioeconomics of this area. We are, um, you know, there is a high de demand for, for purchasing sex. Um, there is also a lot more dis disposable wealth in this area. Um, the proximity to the highways, we have the 401 and the 403 that run across Halton region, um, which you'll find um, that we have the motels or hotels across. So that makes it, um, makes it convenient for traffickers to be able to transport people um, in and out of the region. Um, there's a denial of the crime in this area. As I've mentioned, um, Halton is a uh, higher socioeconomic wealthy uh, community, and so there is this denial that it doesn't happen here. Um, also, the payout for uh, sex traffickers. I in general, sex traffickers could make upwards of $250,000 a year per person that they traffic, um, so the payout is is quite large, and we see that that's another reason why trafficking um, is happening in Halton as well as uh, Ontario and Canada. So there are signs to sexual exploitation. The first one is having multiple cell phones or not knowing their cell phone number or doesn't have control over their cell phone. In this case, the trafficker usually has control over the victim's cell phone. There could also be excessive concern about displeasing their partner or obsession with their partner. So if someone says that they're scared of making their trafficker angry, that could be a sign of exploitation. Aspects of their life that are becoming increasingly controlled. Knowledge of the sex trade, knowing the ins and outs. Withdrawing from old friend groups, family, or previously enjoyed activities and starting to become more isolated from them. New friends and partners that you have never met, possessing, possessing unexplainable money, sex toys, hotel room keys, fake ID, and sudden changes in appearance such as wigs, new makeup, and new wardrobe. There can also be unexplained and frequent school absences, signs of mental health issues, them becoming more secretive or lying. That could be about their location or about what they're up to frequent trips to hotels or motels or traveling to big cities as they're always on the go, unknown whereabouts for extended periods of time or sudden changes in routine as the trafficker has control of the routine, increased substance use, branding tattoos as those tattoos may have the perpetrator's name um, tattooed on their some sort, of some sort of part of their body, becoming hypervigilant, feeling like they're always being watched or surveilled even if they're not around other people, hyperarousal and exhibiting signs of stress where they may feel like they're going to do something wrong and they're never in the right. So where do traffickers recruit? Um, we have seen an increase in, in tra traffickers recruiting through social media platforms uh, such as Instagram, dating apps, um, Facebook, um, online chat or gaming platforms as well. Um, shopping malls, that's usually where youth frequent group homes and shelters as well, community centers, uh, parties or clubs. Um, in, in school settings, we've, we've seen that happen where it, you, know, you might have a peer that might recruit someone, um, work as well, and then ads for jobs such as modeling or being a brand ambassador. Um, very often people will, may get um, messages on Instagram from someone claiming to, to want to hire them for, for a job. Um, I, I would say, you know, that's something to be very cautious about and, and do some research on. Um, you know, traffickers are usually looking at um, a certain demographic, age groups such as um, youth um, to lure into sexual exploitation. So how to support survivors? You never know there could be someone around you that is going through trafficking and in order to support them, it's important to accept their level of readiness for change. It's not going to happen with the flip of a switch. Um, building capacity for decision making where you have to start small. Listening, so this is where you exercise non-judgment, respect, and patience. Building trust and showing up, making sure that you are present and listening to them. 
validating and affirming their experiences, even though you yourself have never been in that experience, it's important to still validate them. Recognizing and accepting that you don't know anything. Being respectful, expressing concern for their safety and well-being in an appropriate manner, where you reach out to other resources. Creating a safety plan with them in the event that they do get trafficked again, or if they are missing, you know what action to take. Working with survivors' anger, fear, or um, even other feelings that have to do with you understanding and being empathetic with them. It is important that they are going to be angry at first, but you still need to listen to them, be empathetic. Connect them with the appropriate services and supports in practicing unconditional positive regard. Mm -hmm. Um, just, I wanted to highlight something about this. Um, so Roma, Ro Roma has explained that it's important to be respectful and listen, uh, being non-judgmental. So approaching this with a, from a space of um, truly wanting to understand what someone is going through, not judging them, um, and not um, gossiping or telling anyone else about what is happening with them. They are trusting you with this. So if someone does, if you do identify some of these signs, um, perhaps ask a few questions. Uh, but also respect that sometimes some people may not be ready to tell you what, what they're going through. Um, but allowing them the space to, to step in um, and have these conversations when, wi with you when they are ready. So approaching this from a place of true understanding, empathy, and non-judgment. Um, we wanted to highlight some local um, human trafficking resources, uh, anti-human trafficking resources that exist here in Halton. Um, Service of Halton is one, but we also work with EFRI, um, Victim Services, the reg Halton Regional Police Services, um, there's Radius Child and Youth Services that's able to provide counseling to anyone under the age of, so Service provides uh, supports to those above the age of 16, uh, but anyone under the age of 16 can access resources um, through Radius. Um, the YWCA um, in Hamilton and Niagara, and then we have the National Canadian um, Human Trafficking Hotline. Um, if you did connect with a hotline um, in any, they would be able to provide you with um, access to services or resources in any um, region or province in, um, in Canada. And so at Savis, we also have the anti-human trafficking team where we have um, a line for general inquiries and an intake line. We also have 24-7 20 support and crisis line that's run by volunteers. And then for public education inquiries, feel free to web visit our website or email us at the provided email um, for more information. And I, I recognize that you know, this we, we are gonna have questions after, but if you folks did want to reach out to us, feel free to send us an email, and we can connect you to someone at Savis that may be able to support or answer any questions that you may have. Um, I also just wanted to highlight, uh, we do have the Halton Collaborative Against Human Trafficking, like I mentioned previously, that consists of um, you know, over 30 organizations that work collaboratively in Halton. Uh, as part of that, we do have one organization that is going to be presenting uh, later today um, about um, trafficking as well in Halton. And then uh, this is just a list of all the agencies um, that exist on uh, the Halton Collaborative Against Human Trafficking. Um, so that is our presentation for today. Um, we do appreciate everyone listening to us um, and you know being so so present. Um, if you do have any questions, I know that uh, there's going to be an opportunity to provide those uh, later to us. Um, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna close right now. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, right now, we're going to put up a uh, QR code that you can scan on your phone. And if you would like to uh, ask a question, uh, they'll be able to answer a few questions now since we have some time. And then there will be a question and answer period um, after. So um, we'll just wait for the QR code to come in. I was thinking there's maybe the police are here.
that's why that's why we I lost it. Well, it's not through me, it's through the police uh, through the superintendent. I can't do anything. Yeah. Is this a <laughs> we do have some marketing material. Um, hello? Hi. Sorry. Um, just a little note, we're going to... <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, just a little note, we're going to put out some brochures and some handouts that provide more information about our programming as well as trafficking um, somewhere, I think, over there in the back. So please feel free to go over um, and get, get some brochures or some pamphlets. And we also have bookmarks, right? Yeah, some bookmarks as well. Okay. Thank you so much for listening. Hi, hi, lovelies. So that was a lot of information that Roman Ravine shared with us. And we may not have any questions now. And maybe part of us still think that, oh, it doesn't happen here. I'll let you know that for the past maybe 10, 15 years, when we had liaison officers here, they were letting us know as staff that it, it's happening because we're along the 400 series, the, the corridor between Niagara to Eastern Ontario, that it happens big time here. I heard a story from one of the li liaison officers years ago, and she was saying that it was happening in Mississauga. The pimp would pick up the girl at lunch from her school, take her to a hotel, and then drop her off after lunch or when it's her class was back up. It does happen and we have to be on the lookout. So when, when, we, when I always say that you can notice things, notice who's maybe lonely, disconnected, get them engaged with the life of the school. Once we network and get involved in extracurriculars, start making friends, that can make a big difference as you know, for those of you who are involved. It can make a big difference and you can be that person who invites and say, you know, say, hey, you, you know, you, don't, you look like you're lonely. Do you wanna join my friends for lunch? We're going to the mall, we're going to Tim's. Do you wanna join us? It's a really beautiful day, let's go for a walk. That could 
be a game changer for someone who needs it. So I have the, uh, okay, so I'm going to field the questions. Um, okay, so first question, these are anonymous. My friend, I'm not going to mention the name, would like to know how people fall for this. I don't know if Roma and Ravine are here and want to field this. Yeah, they're coming. Could you please repeat the question? My friend mm -hmm. would like to know how people fall for this. Um, that, that, that's a great question. You know, we, we find that, um, as, as we've explained in the presentation, that there are several vulnerabilities that exist, um, s largely being sometimes the lack of self-esteem, um, lack of a support system, lack of understanding that what is happening to them is not actually um, be, it, what maybe we portrayed as love is actually, you know, trafficking or coercion. Um, I don't know if many people have lear heard, learned about the term love bombing, but it's when someone is um, overpowered with uh, love and affection, um, overshowered with love and affection, and then that is eventually turned into abuse and manip manipulation. So oftentimes many people do not even recognize that they're in the process of being lured um, because it does seem to be the ideal relationship or they're being loved, um, they are being provided and, and all that provided with um, a lot of support from this person, um, sometimes a lot of lots of gifts um, and being taken care of. So that can many times often oftentimes look like love and affection and kindness, but in fact it is manipulation. So when it does get to the stage where the person is being exploited, um, they are trying to get back to the, the love stage uh, where they were being provided with all this love and affection. So they're willing to do anything it takes to get back to that. So like I said, the, the stages aren't linear. Um, they tend to, sorry, the stages aren't linear, and so the per person can cycle through that. I hope that answers the question. There's another question. What's something we can do as students in a school? Um, I think the first step is uh, having awareness um, through the these these kinds of public engagement um, presentations. Um, having speakers come in, um, having survivors' voices present, and I know that we have that here today um, through restorations. So it's important to have um, you know folks speak about this, have an open mind about it, have an understanding of how to support someone um, accessing certain resources, reaching out to um, your 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 support persons within, whether it be a family setting, peers, or your teachers. Um, it's important to understand and recognize what is happening. Um, is trafficking with someone? A approaching it with non-judgment. Um, and then just being able to provide the support would literally mean connecting them to certain resources. Because it doesn't, it is impossible for one person to take that all on. It's important to connect them to other people who can provide the support that they need. I can also yeah. sort of add to that. Um, you are also at an age where you're slowly becoming more independent, so it is important to also be aware of your surroundings. Um, if you have a car, see if there's any tags on your car or if there's someone following you. So while you should also be supporting um, or gaining support through resources, it's also important to be aware of your surroundings, even if it's on social media, if someone is um, DMing you, see if that person is um, see what their intentions are. Is it an actual love interest or is it someone that's trying to lure you in and maybe come to a hotel room and so and quote unquote party with them? So see what people's intentions are and just be aware of your surroundings really. We do have another question, but I just want to say the, the age old quip, if it's too good to be true, mm -hmm. then it's sketchy. Absolutely. So uh, another uh, question. I was a victim of human trafficking and want to know how I can be of help to people who have gone through the same thing as me. Um, well, first of all, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I know that it isn't easy to be able to identify and voice that, you know, this is, this is an experience that you've had. Um, so I, I want to be able to acknowledge that. 
Um, and also uh, to, to be able to support the people um, that have been through this um, takes a lot of courage, especially if you've been through it yourself. Um, so important to, again, like I said, recognize that these services, um, certain services and su supports do exist in our community. There is a lot more understanding, awareness, and recognition of human trafficking, um, the existence of human trafficking. So if you have experienced trafficking yourself um, or you know of someone who's experienced trafficking, connect them to the resources. Uh, be, be open to having these conversations with people and allowing them a safe space to to um, feel understood and not judged when they do come to you about their trafficking. Um, I can add on to that. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, I think also as a survivor, it takes a lot of courage, but um, if you could also voice your opinion and your um, experiences if you do did go through any support or counseling because agencies and organizations are always looking to um, gain a, a better support system and always trying to integrate new ways on how their systems can be more supportive for other survivors. So sharing your opinions and thoughts on how things can change to support other survivors who may not be able to speak out can go a long way. Another question, why do people do this? Well, it can be a lot of reasons that um, trafficking occurs. One of the biggest reasons is for um, financial reasons. Um, even though someone may have their life together, may have a career together, they still tend to traffic other individuals because it's kind of seen as like a easy way out and an easier way to make a living where they actually tend to make a lot of money off of one person. I think it's about 50, $250,000 per person, um, which is a lot. And it's, it's just seen as like an easy way out instead of actually, you know, getting through with a job. And it, rather they tend to exploit other individuals. And another one, and, and um, I don't want to censor any questions and respect where these questions are coming from. Why do human traffickers kill themselves? That, that, that's a loaded question, and I am actually going to refrain from answering that. Um, I think there are many reasons why, why someone may commit suicide, so I don't want to speculate. Um, perhaps if there's anyone else um, from, from, um, from the next presentation that wants to take this question on, they could. Um, I'm, I am going to refrain from answering that. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you so all much. so much. Yeah, th those, those were great questions. Um, and I hope to present here again. So thank you. And thank you. <laughs> Ms. Adolph, um, I'm not sure what happens now. Ms. Adolph is here. Hi, thank you very much for coming. This is a very important um, uh, I, uh, piece of information. Uh, the two speakers we're having for period two, uh, the first one is a survivor of trafficking, Michelle, and she's gonna tell her story uh, of uh, how it happened with her while she was in high school. And uh, we had an excellent question of what we can do to help people and our, for our third speaker will be talking about what she has done to help survivors of sex, tra of sex trafficking. So if you're staying uh, for the second period, I, I'm really, ho I hope you can. Um, you'll have two great speakers and then we'll have a question period after. Um, if you need to go back to your classes, uh, we're going to be dismissing you in about five minutes, so you can go back to your classes. Um, if you're staying for the next period, feel free to stay and just wait until the next uh, list of speakers. Again, we do have the QR code at any time. You can uh, post your questions to see if, uh, and then we can discuss them after. Thank you very much.
for being here. It is a heavy topic. For those of you who were here at period one, we are going to continue. Um, I will be introducing Michelle shortly, and she will be sharing her personal story. For those of you that have just entered the small gym for this second part, we do ask for your mature attention to the topic. It is a heavy topic. It's a very sensitive topic. And I know that with, you know, we're at the end of the year and some of us are ready for summer and we're checked out. But dig deep, because we need you present here and we need your mature attention to this. We often think that human trafficking happens somewhere else. I came across a stat recently, uh, a documentary, and we think that slavery is something that is over with, but there's currently 28 million people caught in, in slavery or trafficking. And human trafficking covers labor, the sex trafficking, and 28 million is a lot of people, and it does happen here. And of course, we rely, we start with things, we ground things in our faith. Faith helps us with a broader perspective. It commissions us to create a better world where no injustice happens. And so we have to be aware of stuff. And we are part of a communion of saints. So I'd like to draw attention to Saint Josephine Bakita. Saint Josephine was born near Jebel Ajalaire in the Sud Darfur in the Sudan. Kidnapped when still very young, she experienced the cruelty of slavery as she was sold several times in slave markets in Africa. Finally, she was rescued by an Italian family and brought to Italy where she experienced her freedom and became a Christian. She also felt the call to consecrate her life to God as a nun. She joined the Canosian Daughters of Charity and lived the rest of her life at Shio, a small village near Vicenza. She died on February 8, 1947. And so we pray, and for those of you who are Catholic, please join me with the sign of our faith in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh God, you always hear the cry of your people and have compassion for the oppressed and the enslaved. May they experience the liberation of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. We pray to you for those suffering the torment of human trafficking. Transform us by the power of your spirit to be sensitive to the pain of these, our sisters and brothers. Committed to overcoming this evil, give us the courage to stand up and work for the rights of all people who live in slavery and exploitation. We ask this with the intercession of St. Josephine and Christ our Lord. Our Lady of the Assumption, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And I do want to remind you that if any part of this story uh, you find triggering or it's just really difficult, you can make your way to the small cafeteria. Devin and I are here. We have a lot of staff members who are here, and we will be checking on your well-being. Please do not wander the hallways. We want to make sure that you're okay. Uh, if you can stay here, stay here, or if you can't, the small cafeteria. I now have the privilege of introducing Michelle. She was, she's going to share her story, and now she works for an organization called Restorations. So I do ask that you, you know, again, mature attention, and later, if we have a Q&A period, a QR code will be displayed, and you can ask questions. So let's give a nice assumption, warm welcome to Michelle. Guys, I don't know how to use technology, but I don't want this microphone on the stand. 
Sorry, I'm going to be difficult already to start off. Thank you so much. Hi, guys. My name's Michelle. Thank you so much for having me here today. So I'm actually going to tell my personal story because I myself am a survivor of human trafficking, so that therefore I once was a victim of human trafficking. So my story starts when I was 15 years old, but I'm going to back it on up um, and tell you a little bit about how I was raised. So I'm the eldest of four kids. I grew up in an upper middle class family. Started my early childhood in Mississauga, and I moved to Oakville when I was in grade five. Now, from Mississauga to Oakville, cultural differences. Did not fit in in Oakville. You guys have your own lockers. We had hooks in the hallway. This was a whole new lifestyle for me, and I was like, wow, my old school didn't have air conditioning. Oakville had everything. So I was just, like, sports. I didn't ever play volleyball in my life. I was terrible at everything. I wasn't athletic. I wasn't smart. I wasn't pretty. I didn't have anything going for me. So my siblings really became my lifestyle. I'm also dyslexic, so I have a terrible learning disability, and I really wanted to do good at school, but I just, it was, I was incapable. So my early childhood, I was spent in what I call stupid class, also known as special education, and it doesn't mean you're stupid if you're in there, but I sure felt that way, and so did my peers. So I really struggled socially. I didn't have a lot of friends, I didn't fit in, didn't know where I belonged in this whole world. So fast forward to me entering into my high school years, my siblings were my life. I loved my siblings, they were my best friends, I did everything with them, I used them as like my own personal Barbies and they just did everything I said when I said it and I had the best time. But when I entered high school, they all um, had their own friends and suddenly I wasn't cool. I can, rem can remember the day my sister didn't want to get her nails done with me because she was going out with her friends and I was devastated. So in grade nine, I had like empty nest syndrome. I didn't know where to belong. I'm in high school. Going into high school is overwhelming for a lot of us. A lot of us strive in school. A lot of us don't. I was one of the people High school was not for me. So here I am in grade nine, assimilating to my new school, trying to fit in, and I was just a wallflower. No one really knew about me. I had different social circles in each of my classes. I just tried to get by, but I really tried hard to do well in school, even though it was super difficult for me. And then I met a really good friend of mine, and we became like super close, and we did traditional high school things after school, like taking the bus down to Oakville Place. So that's where we pretty much spent every Friday after school. Now, I'm gonna date myself right now, but when I was growing up, technology was just coming on the scene. So we had MySpace and Facebook just got invented. So it was like the big thing was Facebook. And then we had MSN Messenger. So basically, just like you guys text, we loved MSN Messenger. So we would like go to school and then run home from school and then talk to each other on MSN Messenger all night long. So that's pretty much where technology stood at this time. So one day my best friend, she said, hey, these guys added me on Facebook. Now this is before Facebook Messenger existed either. So they actually wrote on her wall. That's how you communicated with people was on your Facebook wall. So she was like, these guys added me and they said like, they'll come and meet us at the mall and they can drive us home. Not taking the bus home? Win. Why not? If they have a car and they're willing to drive us home, why not? Let me say this, that I was a good kid. I was the kid that parents came up to my parents and was like, oh my gosh, you're so lucky to have a daughter like Michelle. Like, I wish my kids were like Michelle, because I never got in trouble. I didn't have curfews, I didn't have rules, because I would never break a rule. I was petrified of authority. Teachers scared me. Turning in things late would give me an immense amount of anxiety. I would never do any of that stuff, because I was a good kid. That's the only thing I had going for me, was being the good kid. So here I am on a Friday night at Oakville Place. These guys are not showing up. So we wander on down to the Taco Bell and we're waiting for them. So three individuals pulled up in a forest green Lexus and I clearly remember looking in the car and being like, oh, it has leather seats. So it's not a base model. So they have money. And honestly, I really equated money with safety. I'm like, well, if they have money, must mean they have a good job, must mean they're not criminals, must mean I'm in safe hands. So we got in the car and they said, we can drive you home or we can take you out for a bit. Now, this is my first 
inclination in my heart that this was something Michelle didn't do. Michelle shouldn't be getting in strangers' cars and going out. But my desire to fit in was so strong. Other kids went to parties. Other kids did other things. And I hadn't done anything. And like, was I just going to waste my high, like my high school experience? Nah, I was going to take a risk. I was going to get in the car. And as we got on the on-ramp onto the highway, I was like, oh, I hope this goes well. Because if I get in trouble, I'm going to be real scared. But it didn't. We went out. There was some weed. They offered drinking. It was like a fun time. I indulged in some of these activities I never had, but they dropped me off at home. And I didn't get in trouble. My parents didn't know what I did. I walked in, and then they added me on MSN. And they just kept talking to me like, hey, what's up? Hey, who do you live with? Hey, what's your favorite color? Hey, what are you doing on your lunch tomorrow at school? Suddenly, they would come by my school, and they would take me to Starbucks at lunchtime. And I'm like, man. I get to go to Starbucks at lunchtime. Like, this has astronomically skyrocketed my high school experience. Because now I'm not in the calf. I get to go out and do things. And, like, I finally have friends. I finally belong. So now it's the end of the school year, my grade 9 school year, going into grade 10. I'm 15 years old, and I spend my entire summer with these guys. Doing lots of activities that I probably shouldn't have, but I never really got in trouble or found out about it. They took us out. We went to clubs. They bought us things, smoking, drinking. Probably shouldn't have been doing that, but hey, I was living my best life. I finally fit in. I finally had friends for the first time in forever, and I felt so good about myself. I didn't feel like a loser. I didn't feel like I was worthless. I felt like I belonged. Until suddenly one day, my friend, who I was also hanging out with these guys, said to me, hey, I had a really bad feeling about these guys. I don't think we should hang out with them anymore. Now, she had a lot more life experience than I did. I lived a sheltered lifestyle growing up in Oakville. I watched Disney movies till I was probably 14 years old. Like, I really didn't know anything about life, but I thought I did. She lived a much rougher life, and she spotted red flags that I didn't, but it was too late. And anyone that was here during the earlier morning presentation, this was what we call the grooming phase. Like, this was my grooming phase. These guys had me. There was nothing anyone could say or do to change my mind that these guys were my friends. So one day, the one individual who I was the closest with came and picked me up at my house, at my family home. Got in the car, we went and got picked up one of his friends. And again, nothing abnormal. This, things like this happen all the time. We went to an apartment complex, and he says, hey, just go up with my friend. I'm going to be up in a minute. Thinking, like, not abnormal at all. We went and hung out at apartments all the time. So I get out of the car, and I go into this apartment building with the gentleman. We go up the elevator. We get off at a designated floor. And then he becomes aggressive and genuinely pulls me into the stairwell. He goes, you're going to knock on this door and do whatever the guy says. Okay, guys, so if you were in my situation and someone's like, you're going to knock on this random door and do whatever the guy says, what does that mean? Like, I have no idea what you're asking me to do. Like, why am I knocking on this door? Whose door is this? What are we doing? And I remember like genuinely asking him, you're going to come with me, right? And I, he's like, you're, just go knock on the door. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to knock on the door. That's so random. Like, why am I going to do that? At this point, he pulled out his cell phone. Now, this is before iPhones, so this is a flip phone. And they only had like 30-second clips. But during that summer that I was having so much fun, he had clip after clip of me in various sexual acts and he was like hey you don't do it I'm gonna send it to your parents I'm gonna send it to your friends post it on Facebook send it to your school like do you want that to happen man couldn't couldn't I say to everyone now I'm in my 30s now if someone had a sex tape of me now I would genuinely say send it to me I'll post it don't care but when I was in high school, that would be the end for me. And I was the good kid. Like, I couldn't have that out there. So I made a split-second decision that I was going to go walk, knock on the door. I went, knocked on the door. Middle-aged gentleman answers. 
go into his department, perform a sexual act. At the end, he gave me a hug, told me if I loosen up next time, I'd probably have more fun, and handed me money. I went back to the stairwell, the guy grabs the money from me and says, did you get the money up front? I was like, what? I didn't know I was even supposed to get money. I had no idea what just happened to me. I had not a clue. And he said, first rule, always get the money up front. That was my first experience into what we call the game, the sex trade as a whole. And I was trafficked in that moment on what's called an out call, which is where you go over to a John's house, hotel room, wherever it might be, and perform a sexual service. So I got back in the car, they dropped me off at home, it was a silent ride back, and I said, oh my gosh, what have I got myself into? Red flags, I, I knew that that wasn't right. I also knew, like, I gotta get away from these guys. So I blocked them on my cell phone, on MSN, and went about my business. But, like, we still had home phones back then, so they started calling my home phone, and they were acting, like, so nonchalant. And here's the thing, I had such a, like, thing in my brain. I was like, these are my best friends. Like, and he wasn't there. So maybe he didn't know what happened. And they're like calling me like nothing happened. Am I exaggerating? Did I get like the wrong message? Is it just this other dude that's a bad guy? So he said, hey, like, come on, just chill with us. Like, come smoke a blunt. And like, we'll just have some fun like we used to. So I voluntarily went. And guess what? The same thing happened. But this time afterwards, they kind of like celebrated it. They were like, yeah, like you did a good job. And then instance like this kept on occurring, except now I was taken to a hotel where other girls were working too. And it was kind of given like the lowdown of how this whole thing works. Men would come to the room, we'd provide sexual services, they leave money, these men would come collect the money from us and then take us home. This happened for a while until things got more serious. I was given a thousand dollar a day quota. If I didn't make a thousand dollars, I didn't get a drive home. So I had to make a thousand dollars in order to go home. Now, I was doing this after school. It's very difficult sometimes to make a thousand dollars in the evening time and get back home before your parents realize that you're too late. Now here's the thing, I grew up in a hockey household. I don't know how many of you play sports because it really doesn't matter what sport you play, but my brother played rep hockey, so he had shooting lessons, stick handling, practice, games, tournaments. My parents were never home, and I was the good kid. They just left me at home with my sister because I didn't do anything wrong. They didn't have to worry about me throwing a party. They didn't have to worry about me doing something illegal or that I shouldn't have done because I didn't do bad things. So I went unnoticed this behavior. Sometimes I would think to myself, like, honestly, maybe it's not so bad if my parents find out that I'm out till 2 a.m. But they never noticed. So here I am in this debacle of, man, I'm stuck in this situation. But I'm Michelle the good girl. And I should have known better. And I got myself into this situation, so it's my responsibility to get myself out of the situation. Now, at this point in time, my personality took a dramatic turn. Suddenly, my attendance record at school was very spotty. Now, I also went to a Catholic school. I went to HT in Oakville, Holy Trinity, so not far away, guys, like genuinely in our own backyards. I currently live in Burlington. I was exploited throughout Ontario. Probably the place I made the most money was right here in Burlington. Every single hotel you drive by, motel, I don't care where it is, someone is currently being trafficked. That's how close to home this is. In my school, I walked into the bathroom in HT one day, and I saw another girl that I had worked with the night before, there. Things got increasingly worse. Suddenly, you remember when I said, like, I, I really liked these guys. Like, they were my life, my world. I hated them. I didn't want anything to do with them. The desire to be around them was petrifying now. Didn't want to be them, they weren't my friends. But I didn't know how to get away from them. And this is when physical altercations happened. If I didn't get $1,000, if I didn't follow the rules, if I didn't do anything that they told me that I was not allowed to do, I'd get beat. My back is currently scarred with cigarette burns because they used to burn me on my back with cigarettes. If we didn't listen, if one of the Johns brought a bottle of wine and we had a glass of wine, 
we're going to get beat for that. If we don't make the money, we're probably going to get beat from that. I've seen girls being dragged down cement stairs by their hair. They were what we call guerrilla pimps. They used extreme methods of violence and coercion to get us to do. I was not alone. I was not the only victim that they worked with. There was multiple females. I have to make this clear to you all that this was really happening in our own backyards while I was still going to school. I became so nervous that they came up to me one day and said, listen, like, it doesn't matter how you get the $1,000, but if we come by, you're going to have to make us that th $1,000. So I began stealing. I had a part-time job at a grocery store, gave them all my paychecks. Uh, my parents' money, stealing. My siblings' money, stealing. Uh, honestly, I would have stolen from each and every one of you if you left your money in front of me. Did not care. My morals were gone. Uh, my whole personality changed. I was wearing different clothing. I was listening to different music. I went from being that good girl to a complete deviant. I was getting in trouble all the time. I would go to school and then get called down to the office because I skipped school for so many days. And when they would call me on the phone to come down to the office because I knew I was going to get a detention, I would just go right on home. And so our principal would call me at home and be like, Michelle, why are you at home? I'd be like, um, I don't really think you understand how difficult my life is, but I have to do my hair and my makeup, and I have a long night ahead of me. So why don't you mind your business, I'll mind my business, and I'll see you at Monday, okay? And so I'd go to school, and then they would call me down to the office and I'd just go home. Until they used to get other students to walk me down to the office and then keep me there until like I could beg my mom to come and get me out of this detention. I started getting suspended. My attendance, as bad as it was before, pretty much non-existent now. I couldn't do my schoolwork. I was defiant. I was yelling in class. Now listen, for my peers, this was wild because I was that good kid that really never talked, never got in trouble. Suddenly, my teacher would ask me like where my essay is and I would snap in front of the room and start like screaming and using foul language right in class. I did not care. My whole life was stress. Every day was stress. I used to just go to school because it made me feel safe. It was a place where they couldn't get me. Until my pimps, they started parking outside every entrance of my school. So if I left, they were gonna find me. They're gonna make a scene. What I was most petrified of was anyone finding out what was happening to me. That was worse than what was happening. I'll go to a hotel and I'll sleep with different guys for money as long as no one finds out. My reputation meant so much to me. And being in high school is hard, guys. Like I, if someone paid me a million dollars to be in your situation right now, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't go back to high school again. Regardless of my situation, I wouldn't go. I don't like high school. I don't want to go back to high school. But it was really, really hard because these guys were infiltrating my whole entire life. They were everywhere. So one weekend, my parents had gone away. My traffickers had come inside to my house, and there was a debit card on my dad's desk in his office. They said, what's the password for this? I gave them the PIN number. Didn't think anything of it. This went on for months. So at this point in time, I'm about 17 years old now. So we're talking that this experience has now happened for two full years by this point. And I'm a totally different human being. One day, my dad comes home from work, and he's talking to my mom downstairs about money being missing from their account. And I go, ugh, bagged. I'm in trouble now. So they call me downstairs and they said, Michelle, did you take money from this account? And I said, no, my gosh. No, I didn't. Now here's the thing. Technically speaking, I didn't take the money out of the card. I just gave the card to people with the PIN number and I assumed they were taking money out, but I never took the money out myself. So my parents said to me, Michelle, we have close to $50,000 missing from our account. Where'd the money go? I said, I don't know. And I didn't know. I wasn't lying. I don't know where the money went. I didn't take it. They said, Michelle, we haven't seen you come into the house with anything. You have no new items of clothing. You have nothing. Where did you spend the money on? I said, I don't know. They said, you have to be on drugs. And I was like, ha. Huh. 
So here's the thing. A lot of traffickers do use drugs to manipulate and coerce their victims, but a lot of traffickers have a zero drugs and alcohol tendency. Drugs and alcohol cost money, makes you sloppy when you work, you could forget to get money, you can get robbed, a lot of things can happen. So the majority of traffickers don't want you. Not saying that that's not, a lot of times they do use drugs, but in a lot of times they don't. So that's how my traffickers were. I said to my parents, I smoke weed, but that's all. So they said, drug testing you. So they took me and got drug test. And I came back with some THC in my system and that's it. So my parents were at a loss. Like, what is happening to this girl? So they said, Michelle, if you don't come clean, we're going to go to the bank. And we've already spoken to the bank, and they have people on camera taking money out of this account. That was my out. I was like, oh, God's saving me right now. I'm so good. Because I thought in my mind there, listen, they're going to get the surveillance. They're going to go to the police. It's not going to be me. They're going to investigate these guys for theft, which is a really bad thing. And they'll probably go to jail. And then I'm going to be scot-free, and I'm not going to have to tell anyone that's happening to me. Also, let me tell you guys, I don't know what human trafficking was. I'm going to be even more honest with you. I don't even think I knew what prostitution was. Like, I'd seen the movie Pretty Woman. I'd seen some street walkers, but I didn't know. I didn't know anything about life. I was privileged. I lived in a bubble. I had no idea what my life was ahead of me. So I didn't know what was happening to me. So even if I wanted to tell someone, I couldn't. Because what am I supposed to say? These guys are forcing me to have sex for money? What? Like, come on, they're going to ask me, like, well, just don't do it. But it wasn't that easy. I tried to just not do it. I've been trying for years to get out of this situation. So this was my out. They were going to go to the police. Until I cracked in that moment. My dad said, someone's doing something to you. And I was like, maybe. He made me go for a drive with my mom. And my mom's like, Michelle, if somebody's doing something to you, you've got to go to the police and get help. Now let me tell you, my traffickers always told me that if I went to the police, they were going to treat me like a criminal, they weren't going to care, that what I was doing was just as bad as what they were doing, and that I'd be nothing but a slut. So I decided to go against what they told me and go to the police with my mom. I had to go in to an interrogation room where the police asked me what was happening. I explained the whole situation. They then called my mom into the investigation room and made me re-explain everything in front of my mom. Then they turned to my mom and said, well, she's the one that gave them the debit card and the PIN number, so in order to proceed with this investigation, we're going to have to charge your daughter. And my mom's like, what? Like, she's a victim of a crime, so we're not going to be doing that. They're like, well, then we can't help you. So what we suggest is that you change your phone numbers, you use the buddy system when you leave your house, and like just keep her inside. So then I was in jail, like locked down, like the worst period of my life, honestly. I couldn't do anything by myself. If I wanted to go to the convenience store, they made me go with my little brothers and sisters. Like, what were they going to do to protect me? So my life was over. But they finally let me get a part-time job again, started working at Tim Hortons, overnight baker shift. If you thought that was bad, I thought that was the best thing to happen to me because it got me out of the house. And these guys were staying away, so I thought maybe, just maybe, I'm cool now. Like, things were getting better. So after about three months of working and my mom driving me and picking me up, I finally convinced her to let me walk to work by myself. Probably on week three of me walking to work by myself, I'm cutting across the fields of an elementary school, and I see headlights going on from the street behind and I see these guys getting out. And I'm like, ah, I'm in trouble now. So they came up to me and they approached me and they say, where are your friends, bro? Where are your friends? My friends referring to the police. Where are they? You know what, I asked myself that in that question. Where were my great friends, the police? They were nowhere to be found. No one was there. Where they beat me. The one guy got his keys out and stabbed me through my abdomen where it broke the skin. Now I'm covered in blood. They're kicking me. They're beating me. They're like, yo, this is what happens when you go to the feds. This is what happens when you rat. We'll be back for you. I laid on the ground in a park in my white Tim Hortons Baker's uniform. And I thought to myself, man, I'm going to have to go to work right now because I cannot go home. Because if I go home, my parents are going to be like, what happened to you? And they're going to make me go to the police. And the police ain't going to help me. No one's going to help me. These guys are right. They're never going to go away. I'm screwed. This is my life now. So I went to work. And I walked into Tim Hortons, and guess what? When you look like that, 
they just don't let it slide, especially when you're only 18 years old. So they called my parents. My parents called the police. The police came. Now, sometimes when we're in a bad situation and the police come, we think like, yeah, we're going to be like, oh, thank you, police officers, for coming here and trying to save my life. No, I hated them. They're the reasons that I got beat up. Where were they when I went for help? They treated me like a criminal. My pimps were right. These guys aren't going to help me. I hated the police. I didn't trust them at all. I didn't cooperate at all. They wanted to take pictures of my injuries. Go. Get out of my house. They, wanted, they took my uniform as evidence, but I wouldn't speak. I was completely uncooperative. I actually want to say that I was beyond uncooperative. Like I was one of those bratty kids that was really telling them off. I hated everybody. I didn't want anything to do with this. These guys started coming back around. At this time, my parents separated. My dad was out of the house. Now, my dad is crazy. Like, he chased them down the street with a baseball bat. He really did try to keep me safe. But with my dad out of the house, these guys were not scared at all. They started parking in my driveway. One day, they followed my little brother home from his elementary school, flashed a gun at him, forcing him to get in the car, and said, if you don't get Michelle outside, we're coming inside your house. My siblings were just as much of a victim of this as I was, because they lived in fear and terror. My little sister would lie for me to say where I was. She'd be so scared where I am or if I'm ever coming home. And things got really unsafe. So one day they told me, hey, Michelle, like if you want out of this, there's a buyout fee. All you got to do is pay 10 grand and you're, you can get out. Buy out. Then you're free to go. So I came to my mom, because I had no money. I said, Mom, listen, there's this thing called a buyout fee. So these guys, they're going to go away, and all we have to do is give them $10,000. So my mom actually went with me to meet these guys, and she took 10000 of her own money to try to get me out because she was desperate, and she didn't know what to do either. She tried to get help, but it didn't seem to be working, and now her other children were unsafe. They went away, but they came back. So now I'm 19 years old at this point in time, and things are really bad. I'm black and blue most days. My siblings are living in terror. My mom's living in terror. These guys are making me work increasingly. I probably started working two days a week, went to three. Now I'm in hotels about five days a week trying to make money. I was supposed to graduate when I was in 2008. I went back for a super senior year. After my first semester, I was so delinquent at school that I got kicked out of school for not respecting their Catholic values and defiance of authority. There was no point in me being in school anymore because I just got suspended so often. Where was I to go now? My life was over. I'd pretty much given up. Until one day, my mom came to me and said, Michelle, I can't let you be in the house anymore because you're putting my other kids in jeopardy and in danger. So I put together this list of resources for you, and you got to call and get help. Man, who was going to help me? There was no one's going to help me. No one was going to help me. I was done. But honestly, I was kicked out of my house. I spent nights sleeping in porta potties because none of my friends knew what was happening from school. I lived in Oakville, man. I couldn't tell people what was happening to me. I was a good girl from a good family. No one could, like, no one could find out. I slept in porta potties just so people would leave me alone and I wouldn't be seen. Because my alternate alternative was to go and sleep in the hotels. And then I'd be a hotel girl. Because I was lucky. I got to go home to my parents' house. A lot of girls I worked with, they didn't have parents anymore. They didn't have families. They lived in the hotel. They worked all the time. They didn't get breaks. I was a lucky one. This is when things started getting so bad for me that I, one day on a park bench after I'd been kicked out of my house, I started calling this list of resources. The first lady I called was this Hungarian lady with a thick accent, and she was like, honey, what can I do to help you? And I was like, oh my gosh, my mom gave me a list of buffoons to call. Like, what the heck is this lady going to do for me? Then I called all these other services that were supposed to be so great, but since I swore at them on the phone, they said that I have to treat them with respect and dignity in order to get help. So the only person that would re-answer my phone call was the crazy Hungarian lady, and she said, I said, what can you do to help me? She's like, if you need minutes for your phone, we can get you minutes for your phone. If you need clothes, we can get you clothes. If you need food, we'll get you a warm meal. 
I was like, um, I don't think that you're aware, but I have the latest iPhone and it's on a plan. So I don't need minutes for my phone. So it sounds to me like you can't do anything to help me. And I hung up the phone. Like I was a brat, guys. Like, I wasn't like, oh my gosh, what was me? Help me, people. Nah, you didn't want to be my friend. I was a delinquent to the extreme. So at this point in time, I tried to go back to my house because it was cold. I wanted to go back. I wanted to shower. And I said, Mom, let me in the house. I called all your stupid people. Nobody's helping me. She said, Michelle, no one's helping you. Well, now it's after hours. A lot of the resources back in the day weren't 24 hours. If anyone was here from the presentation previously, we heard from Roma and Ravine that there's 24-7 crisis counseling and resources available. That's how great it is to have knowledge about what human trafficking was. When I was your age, there was no knowledge about what human trafficking was. People didn't know. The police did not want to help me. They didn't know what I was going through. That's what's so much of a blessing to be where we are today so we can share knowledge because knowledge is power. I went home. My mom tried to get me to call back these resources in front of her. Guess what? The crazy lady was the only one that answered. And she said, let me come to your house and we'll go on a drive. She showed up at my house at 1 a.m. And I was like, mom, have you lost your mind? You're going to let me get in this crazy lady's car at 1 a.m.? And my mom followed in her car behind us while we went on a drive around the neighborhood. This lady herself was a victim of human trafficking. She was trafficked from Hungary to Canada. Different, but similarities. She said, hey, I think what's happening is some guys, they're making you do this. I don't think you want to do this. I think they're making you sleep with people for money, and they're taking all your money. And I was like, yeah. She's like, do you know that that's called human trafficking? I was like, huh, no, I did not. I had never heard of human trafficking ever in my life. I had no idea what it was. She said, like, honey, let me just try to connect you to some good resources. I can't explain to you guys, but this is the first person I ever trusted, just like blind faith. I just really had faith in her that she was gonna, I could trust her. She brought me to a police station. I met with some detectives, and they said, hey, come back and do a statement. I said, huh, like, I don't, I don't have a lot left in me. I was at my rock bottom. I went in and did a statement. From that point, I had to go to a safe house. My family moved houses. Um, I moved into a brand new uh, place all by myself for the first time, but I was safe. I was away from these guys. The police were investigating. They took me seriously. I finally felt some relief because someone believed me. So I was out. I had to restart my life. I got a job. I had no high school diploma. I had no resources for emotional support, but I was safe. And everyone was so proud of me. And they were like, you're so resilient. You are so powerful. You have such good strength. Look how far you've come. But guys, I'm not going to lie to you that that's not the end of my story. Now I am 20 years old, I'm living on my own, but remember how I told you guys that I felt like a loser before I got in this situation? Yeah, suddenly I felt like a loser again. I didn't feel like I had much going for me. I had no education, I felt stupid again. I had such little self-worth, like who was wanna ever be with me? I was like escorting for years, I was a prostitute. Like my future looks pretty bleak. I had support systems. But one day, I was so broke, I decided, like, hey, man, like, I've been escorting for years, and, like, now I know what human trafficking is. I know what a pimp is. So, like, would it be so bad if I, like, just went back and, like, tried to escort again for myself so I can pay my rent? So I went to a hotel myself. And guess what? I got pimped out again by another pimp. Genuinely. The game became my life. The sex trade as a whole, when you're talking about sex trafficking, we call it the game because it will take you in and pull you in. The criminal lifestyle in general is a game. Let me tell you that through my experience of being trafficked, I've also done fraud. I've, I have a criminal record, guys. I can't do so many things because my life got destroyed. I had to go back to the police to get help after I was beaten so badly that I was pregnant and I lost my child. 
So now I had to go through a whole court process to get away from my next guy, my next pimp. The girl that was smart enough to not get into this again, I was in. But here's the thing, when I left that situation, my mental health was at an all-time low. I could not survive on my own. I couldn't hold a job, man. I couldn't get through my days. I couldn't pay my bills. I had no life skills whatsoever. People that I went to high school with, I didn't have any friends from high school anymore. Their lives looked astronomically different than mine. I was hanging out with the underbelly of society, but these were my people. It's like the only place that I actually belonged. I met my best friend escorting. We were exploited together, and to this day, she's still my best friend. I had childhood memories like you guys did, just a lot of my memories happened in a hotel room. I don't want that for you guys, genuinely. It's not a good experience, but I'm telling you, it happens so fast and it's so hard to get out of once you're entrenched. I was voluntarily a sex trade worker after my exploitation ended. And I met a guy who was a drug dealer and we, entered a relationship and he went to this high school guys he came to assumption so he's right from burlington and we lived a criminal lifestyle together he went to jail i used to go to jail with to visit him twice a week we used to have police raid our house we used to have all these things i'm telling you that lifestyle doesn't pay it doesn't pay four years ago we decided like man we got to get out of this like, we're almost 30, and we got to get out. My whole life, I was like, I cannot be 30 and be online advertising sexual services. I can't do it, man. i got to get out. But I have nothing. But I had to take a chance. Because we all have this unique ability to be better than we are. We don't need, like, I'm, no, I'm nothing special. Like, I'm genuinely nothing special. I just took a chance. And so did he. And we got out of that lifestyle. I've had friends die. I've had friends that are still in jail. I have friends that have left behind that are still in the sex trade, but I'm a lucky one because I got out because I took a chance. My family is a huge point of why I'm here today. My little brother got me a job at Montana's just down the street. I started as a line cook there, and I started telling my story. And I suddenly developed a little bit of confidence. Suddenly, when I told my story, people thought that I had like information to share. And they didn't just like think I was some prostitute that wasn't worthy of anything. And still to this day, guys, I don't have the best self-esteem, but it's a hell of a lot better than it was before. So now at that same Montana's, four and a half years later, I have been only out of the sex trade for four and a half years. I'm now the general manager at that Montana's down the street and I work for restorations, helping other victims of human trafficking through our peer support program, which is just a community of people We've all been through something different. Our stories are slightly different, but we all have this unspoken rule that we went through some amount of trauma and we were resilient enough to get out to the other side. And when one of us is feeling down like we can't get through it, we can rely on each other to pull us through because that's what it's taken. It's taken a huge support network to get to where I am. Guys, I got expelled from Halton Catholic District School Board, and now they welcomed me back to speak. Like, this is a huge moment for me. Like, I honestly feel very privileged to be here today, and I really appreciate you guys being here and listening to me so intently. My one thing that I have to say before I'm done, and I'm gonna hand it off to Laura, she's gonna get into information of how you can help other people. I talked a lot about myself, and I think in this room, like, I see a lot of guys and girls. Guys and girls, you can both be exploited for the purpose of sexual exploitation. I'm gonna tell you one thing though, guys. If you think that pimps and traffickers ain't trying to get you in, they are. You know, like have you ever heard of older heads or like they're calling you your young boys and you're hanging out with these guys? Man, it's because they're grooming you too because you're gonna take the charges. Y'all are gonna go to jail. They ain't. They got lawyer money, you don't. They have things that are gonna get you out. You are just as much vulnerable to become a trafficker from these guys because they'll use the same tactics that they use for females to get them to become victims. You've got to be really careful of your social circles. I'm telling you, I've never met anyone in the criminal lifestyle, no matter how much cast they show you, no matter what they tell you, that's living a good life. 
Jail's not fun. Getting arrested's not fun. I can genuinely tell you with a criminal record, I can't go across the border. I can't do so many things. I can't volunteer and give back to my community in a lot of ways because I have that over my head. No one's a successful criminal. It doesn't happen. It does not happen. I promise you, I've lived it. It doesn't happen. Please, guys, just as much as girls, it goes both ways. Don't fall victim becoming a trafficker yourself because your intention is like, I would never do that to another girl. When they're beating you, when they're exploiting you, when they th have things over your head, you are. Guns, getting guns is so popular now. Man, you're going to get caught. Don't do it. Guys, we all have to keep each other safe. Your teachers and all your support staff here are great for you to just go and seek help. All the resources that you've learned today from Ravlene and Roma, fantastic resources. Guys, before any of that happens, you guys are gonna save each other. You're gonna realize when someone's getting trafficked before they are. You guys are allies. You guys have to keep each other safe. If I had somebody that came to my high school and told me what human trafficking was, maybe I'd trust someone to go get help. I hope that one of you, if you're in trouble, reach out for help, man, because it's not that bad. Things get better when you reach out for help. And I hope all of you remember that even if you make a mistake in life, it's not your fault, and there's always a way out. Because there was a way out for me, and it took me so many years. I was in the sex trade for 13 years in total, whether it was being exploited or by choice. And now I'm standing here today, and my life is astronomically better. So if I can do it, trust me, I'm not special. You all can do it. So thank you guys so much for your time, and I appreciate you all giving me the time to listen. I hope you have a good day. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, heart, heart rending uh, story, but something that we can maybe learn from and we can um, help others with. Now, um, Laura had also saw that there's sex trafficking in her area. She's coming from Cambridge, and she uh, is going to tell the story of what she wanted to do. So we have a situation, trafficking happens. Now, what are we going to do? So Laura's going to tell her story of how she started a foundation called Seeds to help um, survivors of sex trafficking. So Laura, please come up. Really, is this on? Okay. It's very sobering to hear stories like Michelle. And uh, the unfortunate thing is um, she hears many that are similar to hers, and I hear many stories that are very similar to hers. And I'm going to uh, run through a few slides uh, today and uh, won't take too much time, but just wanted to share with you a little bit about uh, what organizations like ours are doing and what organizations like Michelle's are doing. She works for Restorations, which is um, quite similar to what Seeds is doing, uh, just with a different, um, just different variances along the way. So I'll run through a few slides just to give you some statistics and uh, put things more into um, numbers, I guess. Michelle has very sh shared a very personal story, which I hope that you can all learn from and take from, um, as well as the s statistics that unfortunately are, um, there's not a whole lot of gathering information on human trafficking because it is so, um, it's so varied. And, uh, but this is the, some statistics that the government has come up with. And as we heard earlier, what the, um, what the definition of human trafficking is. And these are, yeah, some staggering numbers. 12 to 14 is the average age of sex trafficking in Canada. 
realized that things are a little off. They didn't obviously translate very well, unfortunately, with the uh, um, with the move to the um, to the format that we're using. So, 50 million slaves around the world, actually, according to the United Nations. Some headlines from our area were from the Waterloo Region area. And then sharing briefly, briefly with you, who is SEEDS? SEEDS stands for Supporting Every Eve's Daughter Safely, and it was established in 2018 to address the rising crisis of sex trafficking and ex exploitation in Canada. Uh, it came about through the creation of a number of people. Um, my introduction to the issue of human trafficking came on a Wednesday. I know it sounds very random, um, but it was that staggering of a of a realization for me we had uh, my husband and I had just moved to a farm and um, we had a very stressful time in our lives at that point and so he went to visit his doctor and uh, the doctor had who knew about the issue of human trafficking made the question to my husband would you consider converting your barn into a home for survivors of human trafficking and when my husband came home and told me what he had talked about over lunch, I was like, what is that? What is human trafficking? I'd never heard of the issue before. Um, and so I did research. And then I met this amazing, crazy Hungarian lady that Michelle talked about. Uh, her name is Tamia Nagy. And if you Google her, you'll find a lot of um, accolades and things that she has accomplished in fighting human trafficking in the last mm, 10, 15 years. And then doing research, um, there's organizations in Sarasota, Florida. This is one that we connected with, Sail of Freedom. There's SA Foundation in Canada. There's Father's Heart Healing Ministries. There's Reset Society of Cal Calgary. There's Ratnack, Bridge North, Defend Dignity, Restorations. And then the engagement um, of how SEEDS was created. We worked with Tamea to create a survivor's retreat which was, I think that was the first time I met Michelle. Yes, it was. And uh, which was, um, we won't go into that too much, but anyways, we could talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are, and then with Elora House, which is an organization in Wellington County that is working to help survivors of human trafficking. Beacon of Hope, that was the very first thing that we started um, engaging kids like yourselves in conversations about what human trafficking looks like, how can we prevent it, just raising awareness. And then through the Granary, which is an organic bakery that employed survivors of human trafficking. Um, so the amazing thing is we actually got charitable status in October. But what you need to understand is why SEEDS is needed. <clears throat> As Michelle said, exiting is not easy. You think you're out and you're away from the perpetrators, from the traffickers themselves, um, but then there's so much um, beneath that that you struggle with, like she said, struggling with her self-esteem and struggling with, as we have here, the total reliance on the trafficker. They did, in a lot of situations, not necessarily Michelle's, but in a lot of situations, they, they did everything for her. They provided her a place to sleep. They provided her food, um, all of these things. Um, and they oftentimes have an, in, an intense, often romantic uh, attachment to the trafficker, which is a trauma bond. And for some victims, leaving the trafficker may, re may mean returning to a life of poverty and instability. They're oftentimes given really expensive items like Gucci purses, and they're taken to get their nails done and their hair done and all these things that they've sort of gotten used to, if you would. And to leave that... Um, is just provides, uh, means a lot of instability in their lives. There's a lack of trust, and uh, the victims can often become to believe that the only person that they can trust is their trafficker. Things like fear and isolation, where there's, as Michelle said, and other survivors have, have spoken of this, the retaliation against themselves or their families, and or not being believed by other people, and that's what uh, Tamea struggled with when she went back to Hungary, was not being believed that this had actually happened to her. And of course, there's the fear of the unknown, as we already stated, including how to re-enter mainstream life. 
isolation where they, um, they, they isolate you from your social network and your family, your friends. As Michelle said, she didn't, you know, you don't feel like you have any friends. And uh, so these are all things that, um, why we have, why we've created seeds and to sort of counteract all of these things. The support is a big one. So SEEDS provides a home and a multi-stage program where women receive a personalized education plan, medical aid, trauma therapy, job placement, case management, and restorative services. So these are the ways that, uh, that SEEDS has been helping survivors of human trafficking. I was introduced to um, a young woman back in 2016 who I am still have the pleasure of working with today. And it's a long road. Um, one of the girls that I worked with, she, I had been working with her for about five years, and she's like, why am I not better yet? Why am I not healed? And I'm like, well, the trafficking typically happened to you over a period of time, and so it's going to take time for healing. And so that is a, a primary thing that SEEDS offers, is, is a, a place to stay for up to a year, and uh, with uh, subsidized housing beyond that, just to give you a brief uh, look at what the house that we, um, that we have, just quickly what it looks like. It's uh, a beautiful home out in the country, and uh, there are uh, four bedrooms with two beds per room, so we can host up to uh, eight survivors. And the big... Um, the big part of what we want to do and what we aim to do for women like Michelle and women uh, with similar stories is to provide a place of hope, uh, provide that support that Michelle felt like she was really lacking at the beginning. And um, right now I know she's got incredible supports that continue with her on her journey. And so she in turn has been turning around and supporting other people. So I just wanted to share briefly with you about what our organization is doing and, uh, and how you can get involved. There are ways to reach us. You can find us on Facebook, you can find us on Instagram, um, not on Twitter, I don't know what other social media forms you guys use, but um, those are just some ways that you can contact us if, uh, if you're interested in learning more. So I will turn it back over to Miss Elise. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so right now we have um, a question and answer period. So um, we're gonna have the um, uh, QR code up and you can ask questions. Um, our chaplain, Ms. R, is gonna moderate it and we're just going to have um, Sa uh, Savis uh, come up here as well, so in case there's questions that you might want to add to. And so we'll just be a few minutes getting started. As soon as the code goes up, goes up you can come up with, you can uh, give us some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> As we, as we get set up, 
I just wanted to remind you, and, and um, I was reminded to share with you, to lean on each other and look out for each other. And I said at the first half, you guys are in a privileged position to notice things that we can't. You might notice someone who's not that engaged with school. So you have this incredible power to say, hey, why don't you join my friends? We're, we're gonna go for a walk, it's a nice, nice day. Hey, um, you know, there's this great club after school, whatever it is that you're part of, why don't you join? We have robotics, we have chess club. We've got like so much happening after school. And we know that once we're engaged with life, with school life, you can network, you meet different staff, like different staff members that maybe you wouldn't meet, you know, in your schedule. Time to dabble, photography, art club, chess club. We've got Dungeons and Dragons. Try something new. You can notice who's maybe not really engaged and say, why don't you come with me after school? We're, we're going to go join robotics. It's a really cool club or whatever club that you're part of. There's a QR code. Feel free to scan and submit a question, and we will uh, have our panel, looking very official, uh, address or answer your questions. Technology. Are we in the way of the QR code? Oh, um, no, I don't think so. Can you scan the QR code? <laughs> you want to move over? Should we move over? Yeah. And then the table. Yeah. Move? Bye bye. Okay. Yeah, I might, might, might have to move the, the table. Just oh, do we have to move the whole table? Tin, 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 and Is the table good? Oh, okay. Thank you, guys. They're so good. We have a question, and I think this refers to Michelle's story. What happened to your drug dealer friend in Burlington? Did, ha he, did he get out? Okay, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about him. Um, so I'm pregnant right now with my first kid, so we're gonna be having a baby together in September. Um, I will tell, thank you guys, I appreciate that. So I'm going to tell you, though, that he worry about him. He went through this for years. Guys, he lost a D1 scholarship. He then got offered a junior scholarship to go to the States. He still lost it. And now he's had to work so hard. He's now doing tremendously better, but he has an immense amount of trauma, just like I do. He's had a rough childhood. He went through poverty. He went through struggles. He has learning disabilities himself, and he lost his great dream. Like, he still loves basketball, but he trains other kids in basketball now. He has a forklift job. He's doing much better, but I'm not going to lie to you. Like, we're both, we're, <laughs> we're not perfect like we have bad days uh, we still fight amongst ourselves but he's doing a lot better but this like happened right in Burlington too he grew, like lived in Oakville Burlington he had his whole life ahead of him and trauma can really make things break for you and it's not his fault that that happened it's because he didn't re access the right resources um, but you know what there is still good hope and he's doing well today And another question, again, for Michelle. Did your traffickers ever get arrested? Did they get what was coming to them? Yeah, so my first traffickers, they did not get arrested. Um, so when I was a teenager, the group of three, there was actually three of them that worked together. They did not get arrested. Um, it's still an open case. The police ran out of resources to investigate. Remember, guys, this is, though, because human trafficking was not familiar. Police get an immense amount of training now for human trafficking, so we're seeing a lot more charges. Um, my second pimp that I had, he did get charged. He did not get charged with um, human trafficking, but he did, he pled down and got charged with uh, two counts of physical assault, two counts of sexual assault, so he did serve some jail time for that. Thank you. And this next question is probably for um, Roma and, well, for the whole panel. 
How does sex trafficking usually begin? How does sex trafficking usually begin? Oh, goodness. That's quite a loaded question, too. Um, well, as was stated earlier, the vulnerabilities that are created um, within young women and young men, as Michelle pointed out, that um, guys can be susceptible to becoming the traffickers in the same similar ways that young women can be susceptible to becoming uh, trafficked. But how does it begin? Um, I mean, there's a lot of different ways. Um, unfortunately, it can oftentimes start at a very young age with abuse. Um, when a child has been abused in their home, it creates vulnerabilities and creates normalities, um, things that they grow up thinking are just normal and they that they can be treated that way and it's acceptable. Um, that's part of that's part of it. Um, as uh, other people have pointed out, there's uh, self-esteem issues. There's um, there's poverty. There's uh, there are all kinds of reasons why, um, unfortunately, human trafficking can get started. You guys can add to that if you want. Or I'm being told because uh, a bell just rang, and I would love for this more to get involved. Um, Miss Adolfo. All right, I really appreciate your attention up to this point. We're almost at the end, and we've got some great opportunities to hear your questions. So I'm going to ask that you remain seated, even though you would like to leave and get ahead of the crowd in, this, in, the, class, in the hallways. So we will dismiss you, but let's let uh, Savas uh, reply, and we'll see a couple more questions, and then we'll let you go, because we're getting, we just have a few minute, more minutes. Please be patient with our speakers who came to give their time for you. Sorry. No, con continue. So, now, in the first part of the presentation this morning, where some of you were not here, Roma and Ravine from Savas really kind of explained as well. And in the second part, we heard Michelle's story. So maybe, Roma, Ravine, review some of those yeah, things I, that, I, that I, happen. For sure. Um, I'm, so we, we did have a presentation at the beginning, um, myself uh, and Roma from Savas. Um, we did talk about the vulnerabilities, like um, was just mentioned, that exist within survivors who have experienced trafficking. Um, those vulnerabilities could, uh, could just be that they're young, they're, they're youth, um, you know, they could have a substance, uh, a substance dependency, um, may come from a child, uh, have a childhood or a background or family life that has been, um, has, has created an environment of trauma. Um, so those might be some of the vulnerabilities that exist that may um, cause someone to be trafficked. Um, we also did outline the different stages that exist within trafficking. Um, so there's four different stages that do occur for someone to um, experience trafficking. And very often, um, like in Michelle's story, it is the, the attention, the, the love bombing um, that, that many folks may miss out or may not have um, in, in their lives. So a lot of um, traffickers may use that to lure people in. Thank you. We have a, uh, a question, and again, for Michelle. How's the relationship with your parents now? Uh, my relationship with my parents is good. My siblings are still my life. I work with my uh, brother at Montana still, so we're very, very close. I'm very close with my mom and my um, siblings. My dad and I, we have some disagreements. We were estranged for numerous years, and uh, we don't speak that often, but you know what? It's better than it was before, so that's just it. But I'm very grateful for my family, because without my family, I wouldn't be here, so that's great. And taking note of time, I'll just ask one more question, so, you know, because the bell has rung, and... What's, ad what's advice you could give someone? Like, if you could talk to your younger self, Michelle, what's advice you would give her? What's advice you would give to someone who might be getting caught up in that now? 
Remember that where you're at in life right now is temporary if you want it to be. If you put yourself out there to other places, people and things, you can get to where you never expected. If you do not take the chance, you're never gonna make it anywhere. I personally, for myself, I love to work. I feel like high school is hard for me, but work, I was on the same playing field as everybody else. So I'm a strong believer in getting out there and getting employment. Um, and creating that family dynamic. Your family doesn't have to be what's at home. You can create your own. Laura was saying that I, I've met Laura before. Um, I've been over to Laura's house. She has a lot of connection. Go and meet your people. It might, you know, it might not have them now, but they're out there. There's hope for us all. Thank you so much for being here. Let's give all four of them a warm, grateful applause. Before I turn it over to Miss Adolf to close the events, I want to thank Miss Adolf. She has worked so hard to put this together. She, she recognized, hey, this is a really important issue. We need to do something about it. So I want to thank Miss Adolf for the work you've done behind the scenes making this happen. It's been live streamed. Students from our sister schools click the link and have joined us virtually. So thank you, Mr. Galley and the whole team for making that happen. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Adolph, for all of this. It's a difficult topic, but as we have heard today, it's something we need to have on our radar. Ms. Adolph? All right, thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate your patience. James? I appreciate your patience. Um, please take this to heart. Uh, Assumption will be doing something after uh, to help people who are trying to get out. So if you're interested in being on a team to, um, to help survivors, we're gonna be organizing a drive in the next two weeks. So I'll put it on the notice, and if you wanna help, you can come and speak to me. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Chaplain. Have a good day.